Welcome to Calvary Baptist Church. I'm Pastor Tim Colvin. I'm ready for the morning message. And again, I appreciate Turtle recording this for us. I appreciate his mom being here. This morning, as I continue the message, messages that I've preached, this theme all year long, back at the first of the year, we said that we wanted to exalt Jesus Christ. Because Jesus made the comment over in Gospel of John. He says, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself. And so I kind of made it as a theme this year that we want to lift up Jesus. What is lifting up Jesus? Of course, Jesus was talking about his going to the cross and being raised up on the cross. But I believe the broader application of that phrase, lifting up Jesus, is that when we lift up Jesus, when we worship him, when we give him praise, when we thank him, when we let other people know about this Jesus that you and I serve, then people will be drawn to him. And so last Sunday morning, one of the things that I said that we need to lift up Jesus about is that Jesus made a promise in John chapter 16. He said to his disciples, um, he said, guys, I'm, I'm going to be leaving you, but I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. He calls the Holy Spirit the comforter. I'm going to send the comforter, the counselor in my place. He also made this comment. He says, if I don't go away, the counselor won't come. And so I'm thankful that Jesus, when he did go away, he sent that counselor. I'm, I'm going to read to you what he ends up saying. Again, this is from John chapter 16. He says, I tell you the truth. And again, on Sunday nights, we're making this the, the theme of our Sunday night service right now. When Jesus speaks, he's countless times in the gospel of John, he uses this phrase, I tell you the truth. Whenever you hear Jesus tell you something, this is the truth. And he says, I tell you the truth, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And of course, I went on to the next verse last week where I talked about the counselor. When he came, he was going to convict the world of sin and of righteousness of the coming judgment. Today, I want to look at a different thing that the counselor does for us. Because the Holy Spirit's role is not just one of convicting us, convicting us of the things that we do wrong, convicting us of the things that we're doing right, and reminding us of the coming judgment. Over in Romans chapter 8, and again last Sunday, in our Sunday school lesson time, we looked at Romans chapter 8. However, we did not look at these verses from Romans chapter 8. But this passage of Scripture in Romans chapter 8 tells us something else that you and I just need to absolutely rejoice about that the Holy Spirit does for us. That the Holy Spirit, it says in this passage of Scripture, is there interceding for us before the throne of God. You know, at, at times when you and I are in trouble, we're not even sure what we need to say. And the truth of the matter is, is that and I hate to say this, the truth of the matter is that we're always in trouble. Because, and when I say that, I believe that we have an adversary out there. I believe that, as I've told people here at this church, that our adversary, the devil, not only wants to eat our lunch, but I believe that the devil wants to eat our Twinkies too. Um, the devil is out there and he really wants to make a mess of our lives. And so the good news is, is that there is this counselor that Jesus has described, and Paul elaborates on this in Romans chapter 8, the counselor is there interceding. The Holy Spirit is there interceding for us before the very throne of God. And I believe that this means that he's interceding on our behalf. Some people may choose to disagree with me, but I believe that the Holy Spirit is there interceding on our behalf 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I believe that he loves us, he is living within us, and he wants to work in our lives. Of course, the goal for him interceding isn't just to protect us, but the goal is to help us to become like Jesus Christ, because the Holy Spirit's role is to bring that holiness into our lives that we might be made into the likeness of Jesus Christ. So I'm going to read for you this passage of Scripture from Romans chapter 8, Verses 26 and 27. That's going to be the message this morning. 
It says in the same way, the spirit, and that is the Holy Spirit, helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. So this morning there's several things that I want to comment on about this passage of Scripture, and I hope that I don't leave anything out that's vitally important. But the first thing that I wanted to comment about in this passage of Scripture from Romans chapter 8, verse 26, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. Do all of us have weaknesses? Absolutely. Oftentimes when we read this passage of Scripture, our immediate thought might be that the Holy Spirit is there to help us with our physical weaknesses. And while there is truth in that, I don't believe that those are necessarily the weaknesses that are even the most serious within our lives. I know some people say, well, the physical weakness that I have is pretty serious, pal. If you ended up having this with the weakness that I have, you don't understand. But there are all sorts of weaknesses that you and I have. Um, for instance, you and I might have a weakness in faith. I'm reminded of the Father um, when Jesus had come back from being on the Mount of Transfiguration with Peter, James, and John, he came down off the mountain, and I believe that there was a, a, a father there that had a son that was possessed with an evil, evil spirit. And the evil spirit would oftentimes take control of the young man and throw him into the fire, or I think maybe even into the water, and it would almost kill the young man. And the father was kind of at his wit's end, and, and, and Jesus ends up saying, I can help if you believe. And the man says, I do believe. Help thou my unbelief. You know, I, I realize, Lord, that you can end up doing it, but, you know, I just don't, after all of this struggle that I've had with him, you know, I just begin to wonder whether or not anybody could really do anything with this guy. And so sometimes we can approach the Lord with, you know, the problems that we've got, and we've got a weakness in our faith. It could be that we've had a loved one that has really struggled with something. We just end up saying, you know what, they're never going to change in fact, we might even say, I've said it from time to time, tongue in cheek, I don't even know that the Lord could help them. I may be saying it almost in a joking manner, but we could have a weakness in our faith that we end up saying, you know, Lord, I know that you're able, but I haven't seen you do anything, and I just don't know if it's going to do any more, any good anymore to ask you to do anything. Um, and I end up thinking about John chapter 5, where the man that was the paralytic, 38 years he'd been in that condition. You know, he might have had that idea when Jesus asked, you know, could I help you get in the water? And, you know, the, the, the guy could have just given up because it just doesn't seem like anybody can help. And you and I can reach that point within our lives. You know, it doesn't do any good anymore, Lord, to end up praying. And the last thing that the Holy Spirit wants to see within the God's children is for God's children to lose faith in God. The Holy Spirit is there interceding. Hey, Father, you see this child down there? They're really, really struggling with their faith. And I tell you, I'm grateful that Jesus sent the Holy Spirit because the Word of God says, when I am weak in my faith, I've got the Holy Spirit there interceding on my behalf, saying, hey, Father, I've got a child here that's struggling. It's not just weakness in faith. You and I might have a, a weakness in our, and I pulled out some of these things from uh, one of the commentaries that I read. We can have a weakness in the things that we know. Lord, I, I just don't know enough. And the Holy Spirit is there before God the Father and saying, hey God, you know, this person has a good heart, but they really have a weakness. They don't know everything that they should. They're going to need some additional help at this point. It could be that you and I don't have enough experience 
We're greenies. We're greenhorns. We're rookies. And the Holy Spirit ends up saying, hey, Father, I know that you've got this child in your hands, but really they are still a child. They're not as experienced as somebody that's been in the faith for years and years and years. And Father, they're going to need some additional help. We might have a weakness in our conscience. You know, some people, and I'm going to use this as an illustration, some people have very strong consciences. You know, they do something wrong, they feel convicted about it. Other people, they don't have a very strong conscience. And the, the Holy Spirit is there interceding, saying, Hey, Father, you know, this person with their conscience, they're going to need some help here because they've got a weakness there. I'm just saying that this passage of Scripture says that the Spirit is there, and you and I have to take this by faith. That is what so much of the Christian life is about. I can't see this happening. I can't see the Holy Spirit there before the Spirit, before the throne of God. I have to take by faith what the Word of God has said and believe it. That when I'm having these periods of weakness, I'll use this as an illustration. Some people really struggle not just with their consciences, but they have a weakness in their moral character. There are some people that you couldn't get them to lie if you held a gun to their head. And there are those other people that they end up saying, you know what? Yeah, I kind of stretched the truth or maybe I told an outright lie. And the Holy Spirit is there before the throne of God saying, hey God, this person here needs some help. That's what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit is there helping us. Father, this person is struggling in their walk. Um, some of us will end up, and I'll get off of this, it's the last note that I've made on it. Some of us might have a weakness in our gifts of the Spirit. What are the gifts of the Spirit? Could be the fruit of the gifts. Some of us might not be very loving. Some of us might not be very peaceful. We may not have joy. There may be other qualities that we have. We may not be very forgiving. And the Apostle Paul says, folks, look, look, I want you to understand that as you're going through life, the Holy Spirit is there on your behalf. Understanding what your weaknesses are, and everybody has weaknesses, me included. Everybody has weaknesses. The Holy Spirit is there interceding on our behalf. I kind of use as an illustration when Jesus was going into Jerusalem he told the disciples what was going to happen that everybody was going to run off and leave him um, Peter stood up and says hey Lord I want to let you know even if everybody else leaves you I'll never leave your side and it wasn't just Peter that said that because it says that the other disciples basically said the same thing. And then Jesus turns to Peter and he says, Hey, Peter, Satan has desired to have you that he might sift you like wheat. But I've prayed for you. I know what you're going to do. And in a real sense, this is what the Holy Spirit does for us. The Holy Spirit prays for us. You know, Jesus knew when he was, when he was, getting ready to uh, be taken captive. He was there in the garden of Gethsemane and he came back to those disciples. And he knew that those guys should be praying and he told them, he says, you guys need to be staying awake and praying, but they were overcome with sleepiness. And Jesus had to just trust God to take care of these guys. Um, so the Holy Spirit is there to help us in our weakness. The second thing that I was gonna say about this passage of scripture we do not know what we ought to pray for. I know that sometimes we end up saying, well, I've got a prayer list. I know what I, I, know what I need. I know that, you know, I've got a sick relative or I've got this person that I'm concerned about or I'm lacking the funds or I'm needing a new job. or We've got a list of things. And, and you say, hey, look, 
I know what I need to pray for. And the Apostle Paul says, um, no, it's right for you to have some prayer requests, but you really don't know what you ought to be praying for. What does it mean, ought to pray for? It means that you and I many times don't recognize the deepest needs that we have. It's those deepest needs of our lives that affect who we are as a person. And the Apostle Paul says to these Christians at Rome, he says, look, I want you to understand something. That when you are busy going about your stuff, the Spirit of God is looking inside of your heart, looking inside of your mind, and you can't, you can't fool the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God understands you better than you understand yourself. And the Spirit of God is praying for those things, interceding for those things, asking God for help to help you for those things in your life that you're not even aware of. Sometimes we might end up saying, well, I prayed for everything that I, I know that I needed. And I think that the Apostle Paul says, you prayed for the things that you thought that you needed. The Spirit of God prayed for, interceded for those things that you definitely needed. What are the things that we definitely need? Are the, the things that we definitely need the temporal things of this life? No, no. If I were to go down to the 28th verse, it's not part of the verses of Scripture that I wanted to focus on this morning. But in the 28th verse, it says, We know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. For those God foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of His Son. What is the goal of the Holy Spirit's work within our lives? Is to remake us, fashion us into the likeness of Jesus Christ. And being fashioned in the likeness of Jesus Christ means that there needs to be a complete overhaul of who we are on the inside. That we no longer live according to what we want to do. That we are no longer living to serve our nature but we are living to serve this new nature that is present within us, the new nature of God's presence through the Holy Spirit within our lives. But it says, we do not know, going back to this 26th verse, we do not know what we ought to pray, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. What is a groan all about? A groan is basically to let us know that there's something that is troubling us on the inside. You know, we go as we get older. By the way, I read this in an article this past week. It's not very encouraging news for me. But apparently a survey was recently done in which they tried to determine what age people are when they are considered to be old. Do you know what the study ended up finding? Most people consider the date that a person officially becomes old or the age that a person is when they officially become old is 57 years of age. I saved the article. I saved the article because I am now 58. And I said that, well, I guess that I'm, I'm old. I sent it to one of my church members that's in her 80s. Um, she turns, uh, maybe it's today, she turns 83, or maybe it was earlier this month. But I ended up saying, if 57 is old, then 83 must be ancient. And then I said, and then I said, I guess when you reach 90, you get labeled as being prehistoric. So, and Turtle is looking there with this look on his face that I'm going to be in real trouble for saying that. But having said that. The Holy Spirit, the reason I mentioned about the age thing is that I notice that as I get older, 
and I go to get up from some place, I start groaning. Mm. And if somebody had asked me, say, what are you groaning about? And the older I get, the, I think I would end up responding, well, it's tough. It's not just the pain of hurting, but it's also the energy that I'm having to exert in order to get up. There's, there's a list of things that I could end up saying what the groaning was all about. You know, when I go to straighten up and stretching those muscles back out the way that they're supposed to be straight, stretched out. And I, I'm just saying that the groan represents that there's extreme discomfort. And it says that the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, he intercedes for us with groans. And, and to me, it means that he feels that pain. And it's something that he's communicating to God, Lord, this is something that really is distressing. It's painful. Um, he does it with groans that words cannot express. I can't tell you everything that's going on, but Father, I can tell you this much. This child of yours needs intervention from you. And then he goes in this 27th verse, which is the rest of the message. The one who searches our hearts. Who's that? God. He knows the mind of the Spirit. Because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. And so the good news for me, and I pray that this might be of an encouragement to you, especially as you're going through life, and many times you're, you're, you're facing things and you feel overwhelmed. The, the good news from the Word of God is, and this is why we need to lift up Jesus Christ, is because Jesus ended up knowing, hey folks, look, I know that you're going to have a rough time. That's why I'm sending the counselor. And the counselor's role isn't just to point out the things that you're doing wrong. The counselor's role isn't just to point out the things that you're doing right. The counselor's job is not just to remind you that there's a judgment, but one of the very other important things that the counselor does, the counselor is there on your behalf before the throne of God, expressing to God in, in a language that God understands about what your needs are and what my needs are. Do I understand everything about myself? No. But the Spirit of God understands me far better than I understand myself and far better than I will ever understand myself. And the good news is that this Spirit that understands me completely is there before the Father on my behalf, interceding, saying, Father, this child of yours has this need within his life and you need to figure out a way father to meet this need in meeting the need the purpose isn't just to say oh good that was taken care of the purpose of meeting the need is that I might be made into the likeness of Jesus Christ his son that I might be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ the whole purpose of the Holy Spirit's work in our lives is to refashion us to become like Jesus Christ. So the Holy Spirit is there on our behalf working to make us like Jesus. And again, if people will see Jesus, they can see Jesus lifted up in our lives. People will be drawn to Jesus. If they can see us living out Jesus, People end up saying, man, oh man, that wasn't, that wasn't the normal thing to do. Why did you do that? Because I felt like it's what Jesus wanted me to do. Jesus says, if I be lifted up, I will draw people to myself. Again, I pray that you and I might be thankful for the presence of the Holy Spirit. Let me just end the message by saying this. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, Jesus has not sent his Holy Spirit to live within your life. Now, the Holy Spirit can still convict you. But I'm telling you what, 
when you invite Jesus to come in your heart, the Holy Spirit comes to live within your heart. And these promises from the Word of God are that that Holy Spirit that's living in your life, because you've invited that Spirit into your life, that Spirit is interceding toward the throne of God, saying, Father, please help this child to become like Jesus. That is my prayer, is that all of us might be made in the likeness of Jesus, that people might see Jesus through Christians we wear his name. You get Jesus, you get the Holy Spirit to come in your heart by saying, Lord Jesus, I believe that you came and you died on a cross 2,000 years ago for my sins, and I ask you to take my sins. I believe that you pay for them with your life. And I ask you to forgive me of my sins. And I want you to come into my heart. I want you to help me to live the way that you want me to live. I want to turn from doing things my way. I want to do them your way. Come into my heart and save me. And the Bible says that when you do that, the Holy Spirit comes to live within your heart. And the Holy Spirit will be there not only to teach you, but also to intercede on your behalf that you might become like Jesus Christ. Let me close by having closed the prayer. Father, I thank you for your word because without your word, we would not understand what is needed within our lives or what you would want us to know. But I thank you, Father, that your word is there to give us instruction. And I thank you for the precious promise today that Jesus has given us. Not only did he send his Holy Spirit to convict us and to remind us of everything that he taught us, but here in this passage of Scripture, we're reminded from Paul's writing that your Spirit was sent to intercede on our behalf. All of us have weaknesses. All of us have areas that we need to grow in. What a joy it is to know that your Holy Spirit understands those weaknesses and he's interceding before your throne, asking you to help us to grow in those areas, that those weaknesses might be taken out of the way so that we might be stronger in our walk with you. Please bless this lesson to our lives and us to your service. Help us in becoming like Jesus. For it's in the name of Jesus Christ, your son, we pray. Amen. Amen.